Welcome to section 11.6, which we will discuss muscles of the abdominal wall in. Our abdominal muscles are there to basically compress and hold our abdominal organs in place. And they can also have a role in forced expiration. So earlier when hopefully you did this along with the video, when you pushed all of that air out of your lungs, you may have even felt tension within your abdominal muscles in order to get all of that air out. And then they are going to work to flex our vertebral column, except for the transversus, abdo transversus abdominis, which really helps to just compress our abdomen. So first we'll talk about external oblique muscle, which is gonna be this muscle here on the lateral side of our abdomen. And you could see this lateral view of this muscle here as well. Um, it's gonna be the most superficial muscle on that lateral side. And we see that the fibers are moving inferior medially here. And as we continue medially, we will see that it forms an aponeurosis, which you see pictured over here. Um, and eventually when we move inferiorly, you'll see that the aponeurosis of this external oblique will create the inguinal ligament, which is pictured over here. Deep to the external oblique, so layered underneath it, we will have this internal oblique muscle. And that's what we are seeing over here too, although it's just a small smidge of the muscle fibers there. Um, we are going to see that its fibers are going to extend superior medially. And it's going to form an aponeurosis anteriorly as well. And for our last layer, transversus abdominis, which we just see a little window cut out here, that's going to be found deep to the internal oblique muscle. And we see that the fibers are moving transversely. And it too is going to form an aponeurosis anteriorly. So I really like this um, cross section of these oblique muscles and the TA. So here is our lateral view. So imagine we like took this slice from over here, or it can even be on this side. So this is the lateral abdomen, and this is more of the, um, I want to say closer to the mid-sagittal uh, or midline of the abdomen. So we can see here most superficial is that external oblique muscle, and there's its aponeurosis. Next is the internal oblique that's kind of in the middle, and it's aponeurosis here. And then we see the transversus abdominis muscle, which is the deepest, and it's aponeurosis here. Now, as the aponeurosis is extending, we see that the aponeurosis of each of these muscles are going to wrap itself around the rectus abdominis muscle. So here is the rectus abdominis muscle here. Its location is anterior medial, and its fibers run vertically, hence the rectus name meaning straight. And it's partitioned into four segments, although sometimes it's only three, by these tendinous intersections here. So that's separating out these muscle bellies. And it's enclosed by the aponeurosis here, which is known as the rectus sheath. Now notice how we're going to have all of the external oblique moving anteriorly. And then half of this inferior oblique is going to form the anterior portion of the rectus sheath. Then the other half of inferior oblique aponeurosis will move posteriorly. And of course, our transversus abdominis aponeurosis moves posteriorly as well. So that's going to create our posterior rectus sheath here. And our rectus sheaths on the two sides are going to be connected by the linea alba. So next time you're in the cadaver lab, you can look for this um, fibrous strip that moves down the middle of the abdomen. That's your linea alba. And here's a cadaveric view of those muscles. This being your external oblique. Next layer is your internal oblique. And there's our transversus abdominis. And then more medially, of course, we can find your rectus abdominis, and there are those tendinous intersections here. Now, our unilateral contraction of the oblique muscles, meaning we're only contracting it on one side, um, 
along with the transversus abdominis is going to help to laterally flex that vertebral column and rotate it toward the side opposite of that contraction. So if you, let's say, contract your right oblique muscles and transversus abdominis, that means you are going to do a right lateral flexion and then also you can rotate to the left when you are only contracting that right side. And the last thing I want to mention here is with that aponeurosis of the external oblique, you can see how it would form that internal ligament. That internal ligament, by the way, spans from the as-is, the anterior superior iliac spine, and over to the pubic tubercle. Now let's take a look at this clinical view. When we use the term hernia, we're referring to any portion of the viscera or organs that are protruding through a weak point of the abdominal wall. So in specific here, we are going to talk about inguinal hernias, but I did put this image of some other hernias just so you would know what they were in reference to. So with an inguinal hernia, we have a loop of the small intestines that is protruding through the superficial inguinal ring, um, which I'll point out down over here in this illustration. Notice how we have the external oblique muscle here, the aponeurosis, and then the inguinal ligament. So it's a part of that aponeurosis in which we'll have a little opening for nails, the spermatic cord to extend on out, um, which leads to basically the, um, the scrotum. We'll get into more of that anatomy in our reproductive lecture. And in females, we have the round ligament that extends through here. So this is going to um, occur more in males because their inguinal canals are larger for this spermatic cord. So we don't see it too much in um, within females. In females, they can typically have inguinal hernias due to pregnancy and pressure in this area or femoral hernias. Those are more um, apt to happen to females. And we are gonna notice a high abdominal pressure for example, straining to lift something um, that can push that intestines into the canal. So you can see this very well over here where this inguinal hernia has moved into the scrotum. Um, and this example here, it has only moved through the canal. So I wanted to show you an image of what this would look like on a patient. It seems that this patient already had surgery for a hernia, but it looks like it reoccurred here on the right side. Um, and then physicians are going to test this by palpating for the inguinal ring while the patient coughs. So they would just kind of feel right in this area here. And that cough is going to raise the abdominal pressure in order for that physician to feel for the um, bowels in here. And so this example that I described is more of a indirect inguinal hernia but sometimes it can be a direct inguinal hernia in which it is just near the canal, but not all the way through the opening, this um, superficial inguinal ring opening.